Hampton, our next guest, uh, not only writes great books, but also calls great games. As you heard in the highlights earlier, uh, the uh, legendary voice of the Oakland A's, our good friend Ken Korak. Good morning, Ken. It's Dave Collin. Jay, how are you this morning? Hey, Dave. How you doing? It's great to be with you guys. Great to be with you. And uh, I'll tell you, I just want to get right to it. We'll talk about the A's, but let's get to the book first. And I know you were on with uh, the lowdown yesterday, totally different audience. I want our audience to know, because we do talk A's quite a bit throughout the year, as you know, uh, when somebody opens up the cover of that book, what are they going to read? Well, it's a little bit of a random collection. I think someone described it as eclectic. But as you know, I've I've been uh, broadcasting for the A's for 24 years. Susan's been on the beat for the Chronicle for um, two decades. <laughs> so there's it's it's almost kind of a two part deal in looking at the book. Uh, number one, we reflect back on a lot of the things that we've seen and we've covered best games that we've had the chance to cover. Uh, there's a chapter on the weekend that we spent in Cooperstown when Bill Kane received the Frick Award in 2017. Uh, Shaw Manaya's no hitter, Braden's perfect game. Uh, some of it is autobiographical, uh, kind of a journey that we've taken to get where we are um, in our careers. And uh, our approach to doing our job without sounding, you know, preaching or pedantic, I mean, it's kind of the way that, that we go about our jobs as a beat writer and also as, uh, as a broadcaster. But then we did a lot of interviews. And uh, so I guess in a nutshell, uh, I would hope that people would think that the book gives the reader a glimpse inside a major league organization of what a what makes an organization tick, especially one that's been as successful as the A's. And we did about a dozen interviews with a whole cross-section of, of people who have worked for the A's or players like Ricky Henderson. Uh, Dennis Eckersley did the forward for us and uh, tried to get a cross-section so that uh, we talked to people who have been instrumental in kind of forming the A's and who they are. Even the voice of the fan from Jonas Rivera of the great animation studio Pixar. Uh, Dave Cavill wow. is interviewed, and we, we decided to to run the interview. We didn't know what we were going to do with them, but we decided because I, we were so enthralled by the interviews that we ran them as Q&As. So they're long-form interviews, question and answers, and uh, so if you're an ardent fan of the A's, and I think even a, a baseball fan, uh, hopefully you'll get something out of that. I feel like we could sit here and talk to either you or Susan for three hours, and you guys could just tell some of the stories that, that you have uh, for, from your time with the A's, when you were talking to Susan and, and you guys were writing this book, were did you learn anything or hear anything new that you hadn't heard before? Like, was there a new story that, that you hadn't been aware of previously? Well, I think from that standpoint, I'm not sure if there were, were too many new stories, but I think we gained a lot of insight into some of the people. Like the interview with Bob Melvin. Um, I think was just great because he goes into great detail about his journey as a major league manager from the time which when he was a, a very young manager beginning with the Mariners and now to a, a point with the A's where he's now won three manager of the year awards and he gets deeply into leadership. And so those things I think are really interesting. And even with, I mentioned Jonas Rivera, who's had this incredible career with Pixar as one of their executives and he's won an Academy Award. And he talks about the vibe in the East Bay and how there's this kind of this renegade image that Oakland's always had that he feels has spawned a lot of creativity with his company, and he ties that into being an A's fan and feels that that, that kind of Oakland vibe has helped to generate a lot of success for the A's. And he draws parallels between uh, being a fan of the A's and the work that he's done for Pixar. So, you know, I think, I mean, to us, some of those things were really interesting. Ken Korak joining us. Ken, I, I'm always very curious about the nuts and bolts. Uh, Susan Slusters covered the team, as you said, for two decades. Uh, you work for the team. So was the, uh, obviously uh, the A's were very, uh, they, they, they encouraged the writing or they were very happy with it. But a lot of times you'll see teams saying, oh, oh whoa, hold on. You guys are you guys are privy to a lot of conversations and a lot of things that, uh, you know, maybe we don't want out. Now I, I understand this isn't some tell all book. This is just spinning stories, but I imagine there was a conversation with the A's and, and, un, and, and very expectedly because they're so awesome. Uh, they were obviously very supportive of you sharing those stories. Well, they were very supportive, but there was no conversation as far as the direction we were going to take with the book. Mm -hmm. Um, there was no interference from that standpoint. I think they trusted us to do our jobs. And uh, Susan and I didn't write any of the chapters together. It's kind of like she wrote um, her chapters and I wrote mine. Now, there is some, uh, there's, there's ties because there's, there's continuity, I think, in the way we wrote it. But one of the great things 
I have to say this about working through the age for the last 24 years is, and I mentioned this at the end of the book, they've trusted me to tell their story and they've done it in a way where there's really been no interference. And I think that for a lot of people in our business, especially when you work for the team and you're doing play by play, there would be the tendency to look over your shoulder and think, what are they thinking? Or for them to put some sort of constraint on what you do in your approach. And I, I really feel like I've had a lot of freedom over all these years and I'm really thankful for that. Ken Korak joining us. Uh, Want to talk about the A's for a second, but I, I got to ask you, <laughs> and forgive me if it already exists because I, I, I can't see it. I'm looking at it right now, available on Amazon. Obviously, you guys will be at the Treehouse uh, this Saturday and Sunday, and we'll repeat all that information. But how many times along the way in your interviews and with your uh, dealings with fans have people asked you for an audio book? <laughs> Well, quite a bit, yeah. and even going back to the Bill King book, <laughs> uh, I really, we really wanted to do an audio book uh-huh. for the Bill King book, but I, I just, it was frustrating because I didn't want to do it without the actual calls themselves. Sure. Because like, like with the Bill, we transcribed a lot of his great calls for the A's and the Warriors and the Raiders, but we had a really hard time in dealing with the leagues to get them to release the audio. Mm. So that was frustrating, and it really kind of, uh, put that project on the back burner. So, yeah, we've had a few people that have mentioned that. And oh. I guess it's something we might do in the future. Ken, I, I could listen to you read the phone book. Seriously. So if they ever approach, <laughs> approach you about doing that, I'm in. <laughs> Ken Korak with us. Uh, athletics, big win yesterday. Did it with pitching. Uh, Astros with a big winning streak stopped. Uh, listen, the, the, the A's aren't exactly knocking down the doors when you look at their record, but as we talked about down at spring training, you and I talked about it. Uh, we talked with uh, Bob Melvin about it. That opening schedule, when you factor in Japan, what was it, 18 straight games before a bye, it was absolutely brutal. So stepping back and looking at it and the fact that they're above 500 at this point, or, or I would imagine you're, you're fairly pleased with uh, with their progress. Well, the worst case scenario would have been if they had been buried after this stretch. Yeah. So, and they're not. They're right there. I mean, it's too early to focus real intently on the standings, but they're right there behind the Astros. I thought, you know, they're a game over 500. I thought the game yesterday was really important for them. And not that you take one game out of context when you play 162, as you guys know, but they were 0-4 against the Astros this year, and they're not going to see them again until, you know, well into the season now. And every game you play against them, assuming that the Astros are the team to beat in the division, which we all, I think, would agree on, there's a two-game swing. So if you lose last night, you're 0-5 against them. Now you've lost five games of them in the standings. So beside the fact that it was a really good win and it was a very well-played game, I think from that standpoint, the A's kind of needed to beat those guys last night, and they did. Yeah, and I think for, for, for me beating them in the fashion they did because they lost that game in in Houston where they were set up. They were up a run. They were going to go Trevino, Trinan, and then it was over. I think it was big for them last night uh, to get uh, that Trevino, Trinan uh, duo in to to close the door Mm -hmm. on a one-run game. Well, it also points out how magical last year was. For the A's to win 97 games. And to think when you do that, when you have that kind of a year, so many things have to just fall right. The A's were 68-0 and when they had the lead after seven innings wow. until the 26th of September last wow. year. In other words, they did not lose a game that they had the lead after seven until the last week of the season. Now they've lost three of those already this year, and those things are going to happen. So my point is to expect that to happen again, uh, you know, that's unrealistic. But as you said, uh, Trinan and Trevino and Trinan had a tough save in the ninth inning. The other thing is that this was an example of the hardest throwers the A's can throw at anybody. When you go Montas and then you go Trevino and Trinan, I mean, they're all throwing 97, 98 miles an hour. And there are times when you need guys to go out and dominate because the A's starting pitching had been in a funk for about a week and a half. And so they went out, and especially with uh, Frankie Montas, to dominate like that and pitch like a stopper, which every really good team has to have. Here with A's radio play-by-play man, Ken Korak. Ken, do you, we talked a little bit earlier about that brutal stretch to start the year, it was the two in Japan and then the three exhibition games and then the 18-game stretch. Do you notice, you're around the team, do you notice the effects of a long stretch of games like that? Well, I, I do. I didn't. I actually felt that, in a way, going back to uh, the series against the Giants, the Bay Bridge series, that that was helpful for them then because when everybody came back from Japan, you're kind of in this various, these various stages of jet lag and, and just kind of being in a daze. 
So when they got back to playing on, on Major League Diamonds, even though the games didn't count, I think those games kind of restarted them and got the energy going. Uh, the reality is, is that they played really well at the end of that 18-game stretch mm -hmm. because they had lost the first four games of the road trip. Then they came back and they won the next four. Now they got rained down Saturday, lost a tough game on Sunday. So uh, ball players, it's, it's funny because you do deal with fatigue and you're tired. Everybody was looking forward to that day off on Monday, but there's also something that something about playing every day and getting into a routine. So I don't think the fact they played 18 games in a row affected them that much because you know they, they played some of their best ball at the end of that stretch. Ken Korak with us. I was going to ask you, we haven't talked to you since the Japan trip. Unless the pictures uh, fooled me, you guys took, I believe, the Atlas Air uh, plane, and I'm pretty sure, based on coloring and the way that plane looked, that's the exact plane the Kings took to China about five years ago. So I, I, I want to try to figure this out. Um, this thing was like uh, the most luxury. This is not your normal plane. Uh, was this the one with the uh, the pods almost uh, throughout that that the lie flat pods and the screens in front of you and all that? I think we probably flew on the same plane. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so the point is, don't feel sorry for us. Right? <laughs> you know, I mean, we did have we did have a twelve hour flight from Phoenix, and we did have a sixteen hour time change. <laughs> And right. there were days when we were in, in uh, Japan where I was dead tired. I never quite, ad I adjusted a lot better when we got back. Right. But the next day I felt great. I don't know why that was, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, this is, this, if you're going to do it, we're very fortunate. And, w and there's actually a chapter in our book about travel. Uh -huh. And for me, I get to fly on the charter planes. Susan has to fly commercial. Right. So we have different experiences from that standpoint, but. Uh, and I wrote, I think one of the, the, I think the biggest difference between working in the minor leagues and working in the big leagues is the travel and anybody that complains about it, uh, you ought to tell them just to shut up. <laughs> uh, we, you know, we really do get pampered. That's the thing when I, 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 you know, coming out of spring training, talking to you guys about all, all the different sleep schedules and everything they passed out and all, all the work that the training staff did to make sure everybody was on the right page. And then I saw on Twitter, uh, I think it might've been Chris Townsend was tweeting out pictures of the plane. I went, Oh wait, hold, 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 hold on a second. I, I've, <laughs> I know this plane the, the, if it's the same layout, the players are upstairs. Uh, then I think it's like 80% first class downstairs. You get your own pod, you have your own screen, you have your own blankets, and then they, they have the little carts of food. It's unlike any flying experience I'd ever experienced before, but I, I imagine still, as you said, there's a there's an adjustment, there's sleep and all that, but hopefully you had a little bit of fun in Japan while you were over there other than the baseball games. Oh, we had a, we had a great time over there. My daughter was there, and I was really fortunate oh. for that. And, uh you know, once we, had, once we got there, the next day was a full day off, and then we played four days and four games in five days, actually, uh, because the two exhibitions, which we broadcast, of course, as you guys know, mm -hmm. uh, and then we had a day off, and then we played the two games against the Mariners. The only, and we got out, there were two days that, that Major League Baseball had planned uh, for tours of the city, and we really took advantage of that, and that was wonderful. Like One was a, almost a full day tour, the other was a half day. So we got to do the tourist thing as well. The only thing that is weird about it was that the two games against the Mariners count. So I think a lot of people didn't really realize that, that you're going over there and it's the 20th of March and you're playing games that count in the standings. And obviously the whole, um, the fact that Ichiro was playing his last two games yeah. um, in baseball, I think added a whole other dimension to it. And so that was really a special thing to be part of as well. Did you, I, I'm, I'm a big food person. Did you eat any interesting foods on your trip? Don't know if I eat interesting foods, but the first night that we had off there, uh, the A's front office organized a get together for a bunch of us who've been working for the club. And it was one of these really traditions. Like you walk in, you take your shoes off the whole deal. And it was literally eight courses. Wow. Oh my now, goodness. Maybe that's one reason I didn't sleep that well that night. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was exquisite. It was incredible. So for the, the entire spectrum of Japanese food, which I love, mm. uh, so that was, that was really a special night. It was great. That's awesome. Ken Korak with us. Uh, Ken, I, I, you you mentioned it really quickly, and I, I just want to go back to it. The you know we 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 had those Jap uh, the Japan games, and when 
Ichiro walked off that field. I, I, you've seen a lot. You've seen so much in your career, and, and, and as you would say before me, been privileged to see some phenomenal moments. I have to imagine uh, being in that stadium and, and watching and hearing that ovation and, and really feeling that palpable energy that you, we just can't quite get on the radio or TV has to rank right up there with moments you've seen. No question. And there's a love affair, not only with the issue, but with baseball in Japan, which is so great to see. The two games were packed, full house, 45, 46,000. And the, the fans came really, I mean, two hours before the game, they were there watching batting practice and just soaking everything in. Now, it speaks to the fact that only one reason for this is that I've been around forever. I called Ichiro's first major league hit and also called his last at bat. Uh, the ground wow. ball was short. He almost beat it out, and Simeon made a really good play, and that would have been kind of the storybook ending if that had been a hit. But we didn't know if he was going to come back out for an encore, and I've equated it with a rock concert, because after the game, uh, many of them, I mean, there must have been twenty, twenty-five thousand 25,000 fans who were still there a half hour after the game ended, and each row still hadn't come out, and they were screaming for him like they wanted this like third or fourth encore, but he was still back in the clubhouse. Or I'm not sure exactly what he was doing at that point, but finally he came out and boy, that was such a, a reward for those fans who had stayed for that long. And he took a little victory lap and that, that really did become awfully emotional. And one thing a lot of people I think don't realize he has a very special relationship with Bob Melvin. Incredibly special. And thanks for mentioning that. Uh, Bob Mel was his manager in Seattle, but the relationship goes well beyond that. They're very close. They spent a lot of time together and each row confides in Melvin. I think he's one of the people over here in the States that, uh, that Ichiro has gravitated toward. And Bob has really embraced Ichiro and also the Japanese culture. Their families, their wives have become good friends. It's not unusual. Uh, it wasn't uh, back when Ichiro was still playing for Bo Mel to spend time with Ichiro. They've, they've gone out to dinner on off days before. Uh, so it's, it's really a wonderful thing to see the way they interact. If these walls could talk stories from the Oakland A's dugout, locker room, and press box, a book signing with Ken Korak and Susan Slusser, both legends, both wrote this phenomenal book. They'll be signing in the Treehouse this Saturday and Sunday from 1145 to 1245 uh, in the afternoon. Books, of course, available for purchase there. And if for some reason you can't make it out there, we encourage you to do that available on Amazon as well. I'm looking at it right now. Ken, man, hold on. Um, 14, I already have my copy. Uh, I'm four, in there. Hold on, I'm looking at this right now. $14. <laughs> that is way too low. I, I mean, I'm not your agent, but but, <laughs> but fourteen dollars for this, but and and you get it delivered within two days with Amazon Prime. I, I'm just saying they may be underpriced it a bit, Ken, because this thing well, looks amazing. Well, we don't make the we don't determine all that. <laughs> but we have we have a great publisher, Triumph Books. They they really did a great job. They were. They were great to work with. So uh, awesome. whatever, it was a labor of love. Uh, you don't make a whole lot of money in book writing, but sure. it's a wonderful experience. So we had a great time. And hopefully uh, A's fans will get something out of the book. And, and thanks for having me on. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. And for you guys to talk about the book, uh, it means a lot to Susan and me. Well, uh, you guys mean a lot to us and a lot to all the A's fans uh, listening who get to hear you each uh, and every day and, of course, who get to read Susan uh, as well. That is the legendary Ken Korak, our dear friend. And uh, hopefully, Ken, I, I, I hope we get to talk to you uh, throughout the season about the athletics. Any Anytime, you guys. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's Ken Korak. You're listening to The Drive.